because people failed to accept and explore the alternative hypothesis, which turned out to be factually correct. Who does that? Who calls somebody by their first, middle, and last name? Isn't that kind of weird? Isn't that kind of culty? He's not Martin, but Martin Luther King. Contrary to what Republicans would like to imagine, Martin supported reparations and he supported affirmative action. And this is what we are faced with. And this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. Any attempts by Republicans to make Martin into something their own is both false and a recipe for defeat. Now, it's hard to remember when the first accusations were made, but at least since the 1970s, probably well before that, there were claims that Martin was a communist, not a real doctor, and that he had sex orgy parties. In 1991, after around two decades of denial, Boston University finally admitted that Martin plagiarized parts of his PhD thesis. Boston University formed a committee to investigate the plagiarism and found that Martin stole verbatim 33% of his dissertation, 45% of the first half and 21% of the second half from another Boston University student, Jack Boozer. And that's just what the committee found. I suspect if a more hostile committee was looking at Martin's thesis, they would have found more plagiarism than that. Not surprisingly, the Boston University committee did not recommend revoking King's doctorate, despite a third of it being proven to be plagiarized. But this makes perfect sense, given that his speeches were written by others. For example, Martin's I Have a Dream speech was written by Stanley Levison and Clarence Jones. So far from holding our saints to higher standards than everyone else, it appears we hold them to even lower standards. This past November of 2017, the FBI files on Martin documents four mistresses he had, an illegitimate child he had, along with the fact that he worked with dozens of communists for planning events and writing speeches. Now, these things don't really carry the same weight they used to, but if released back then, this information would have sunk the image of St. Martin and reveal him for what he was, a dime a dozen black preacher who wanted Gibbs, who was just smart enough to read speeches written by men smarter than him. Why do you even know about Martin? Why is this figure sainted? Why did Martin's rabble-rousing even reach the masses? Well, because powerful institutions wanted it to. Martin couldn't have done anything without the press, and without the universities, because all the newsmen, and later on, all the academics and all the school systems wanted Martin to be a central figure. Martin himself was just a shell. He didn't write most of his speeches, at least not the ones anyone cares about, and he faked his way through college and was just a theologian anyway, didn't even get a real degree. But he was polished enough to ape the talking points of the power elite that wanted an end to white spaces. And Martin being a preacher and dressing up all this anti-white rhetoric and you know, these claims of oppression in Christian language, that made it go down a lot easier. So why was he assassinated? Well, we can only speculate, but I think there's a clue in the FBI's dossier under the heading of Black Nationalist Terror. Quote, one serious danger in the confrontation lies in the proposed action of the black nationalist groups which plan to attempt to seize the initiative and escalate the nonviolent demonstrations into violence. King has met with black nationalists and attempted to solicit their support. Stokely Carmichael of the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, an extremist black nationalist organization, has conferred with King. Carmichael endorses the objectives of King and advises he will not oppose or interfere with the Washington Spring Project's plans for nonviolence. However, he also states his role will be governed by what the SNCC decides. King is aware of the possibility of violence because one of his aides proclaimed recently to the press, quote, jail will be the safest place in Washington this spring. However, in spite of this potentially explosive situation, King continues his plans. He adroitly uses this possibility as a lever to attempt to pressure Congress into action by warning that the Washington Spring Project may be the last chance in this country for peaceful change with respect to civil rights needs. My personal theory, the powers behind Martin didn't want him to start supporting violent action and thus discredit their whole movement and decided that Martin would be more valuable as a martyr than letting him be a potential trouble source. And that's why they put someone up to kill him. That his communist activity could come out, that his sex orgies and adultery could come out, and that he could start becoming more radical. But that's a bit speculative. And while you may be tempted to call me a kook for entertaining such ideas, remember that the people saying that Martin was a communist, plagiarist, and engaged in sex orgies were called kooks back in their day too 
and they ended up being right, unless you think the FBI is making all this stuff up. What's the point of all this? Even if Martin was just a frontman for powerful interests, weren't his goals noble? Wasn't he fighting against oppression? For all his personal moral failings, wasn't his cause just? Well, that would assume that the blacks were actually oppressed. There's nothing oppressive about segregation. All countries are segregate from each other. The US is segregate from Mexico. Greece is segregate from Turkey. Your home is segregate from your neighbor's home. The Dominican Republic is segregate from Haiti. Laos is segregate from Vietnam. And nobody says the Dominican Republic is being mean to Haiti by keeping them out. No, that's a country's right. And that's a people's right. But the idea that there was some kind of oppression even beyond this segregation, well, these are stories you're told as a child, back when your mind is highly malleable, when you don't criticize anything, when your teacher says something and you just accept it. You're told stories about how put upon blacks were in slavery and then in segregation. But this whole narrative was established long before most of the research I'll be citing here was ever even done. The narrative was put in place before the homework was done. And the research I have here mostly comes from the National National Bureau of Economic Research, and if you want to read the papers yourselves, click on the description, click on the relevant articles, and then click on the paper cited for the point you want to look at. So let's start with something simple, height. Now, black people today are actually ever so slightly shorter than white people today. This is something not a lot of people know because they watch the NBA and they imagine that black people are taller. No, they're actually slightly shorter. But during slavery, the blacks were actually taller than their contemporary whites. And this is evidence that their nutrition was probably better than whites. And back in those days, your standard of living was very closely related to your nutrition. And this is evidence that at least in terms of relevance to nutrition, blacks back then were better off than whites back then on the whole. But what about expropriated labor? As slaves, they had all their li the value of their labor taken from them. Well, we know that the profit rate on slaves was around 12.69%. That's, that's how much profit was made on slaves. By contrast, short-term money loans, which is an indicator of the profitability of the rest of the economy, were about 9.98% over the same time period. Now this is lower than slavery, but remember, the business receiving the loan has to be more profitable than the interest rate on the loan is in order to pay it back, which means that the profit for the economy at large was probably about the same as it was for slaves, which means slave labor was being expropriated about as much as non-slave labor. So in terms of alienated labor, the value of labor taken from the black slaves, it was about the same as for the rest of the economy. But weren't they worked brutal, inhumane hours? Well, no. Slaves only worked around 89% as many hours per year as whites, around 2,798 hours per year versus 3,130 that the whites worked. In fact, Trevon Logan compared the volume of cotton picked per day on his family farm versus cotton picked per day throughout the South back then. And he found that his children on his family farm picked 95% as much cotton per day as the slaves back then did. So the idea that slaves were pressed to work particularly hard Hard sounds like a myth. It seems like they only worked around 5% harder than family farms in the 1970s did. What about breaking up families? Well, no doubt it did happen, and that's always terrible, but to what degree? I couldn't find data on how often slaves were deliberately broken up, but consider that according to Stephen Crawford in The Slave Family, a view from the slave narratives, 51.1% of black slaves had intact families. By comparison, in 2011, only 37% of blacks had intact families. Now, what's interesting about this is that I remember in school hearing stories about broken up families, but then in the stories about blacks heading north, to escape slavery, it's always intact families escaping north. It's almost as if the abolitionists who were telling these stories about blacks escaping north forgot that they had also told stories about the black families being broken up and so they lost track of the lie. What about rape? What about voracious slave owners raping black slave women? Well, from Thaddeus Russell in A Renegade History of the United States, he writes, quote, only 1.2% of the former slaves interviewed by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s reported being raped by a master. Only 5.8% reported hearing about the rape of another slave, and only 4.5% said that one of their parents had been white. According to Fogel and Angerman, all of the available evidence taken together indicates that the share of Negro children fathered by whites on slave plantations probably averaged between 1 and 2%. Even Fogel and Angerman's most hostile critics concede that it was no more than 8%. There's also evidence of significant numbers of consensual relations between white men and slave women, which would make the percentage of slave children produced by rape 
even smaller. But even with these reported numbers, how much of that is just hearsay or crying rape for the pity points it gives you? And compare this to today where 22% of black women report having been raped, but also just do a pinch test. How many white men have any sexual interest in black women whatsoever? Not a whole lot. And it's not an insubstantial number of white men who, if they were literally just straight up offered sex by, an, by what is considered to be an attractive black woman, would just say no. This idea that white men were going out of their way to rape black women in large numbers, it seems implausible given how many white men generally don't find black women attractive and wouldn't even have sex with them if offered. And on the issue of literacy, in 1870, the first census with any data on black literacy, we know that 20.1% of blacks were literate. Now keep in mind that in that same year, Russia had a literacy rate of 15%, lower than that of the US blacks. And the continent of Africa didn't achieve a 20% literacy rate until around the 1950s. And this is the relevant context compared to what? If blacks had not been bought from Africa, what would their lives have been like as slaves within Africa? I have an article where I use economic data and data on the number of slaves within Africa to talk about this. Because keep in mind, the Atlantic slave trade was only around 10.15% of the whole African slave trade. That the slaves that were sold from Africa into the Americas was only 10.15% of the total African slave economy. 72% of the African slave trade was all within Africa itself, and the rest of the world took up the remainder. Around 18% of the slave economy was the rest of the world, mostly the Middle East and India. And this was from the years 1525 to, to 1866. And of course, prior to the Atlantic slave trade, well, 100% of the African slave trade was within Africa or around the Middle East. And based on the inelasticity of supply, which simply means that supply can't be increased in response to increase in demand, there's strong evidence that the number of slaves produced in Africa did not increase or decrease with fluctuations in foreign demand. That the number of slaves produced within Africa was a fixed amount and those slaves were bought and sold around the world. And when the Atlantic slave trade was cut off, the number of slaves within Africa that were produced didn't go down. They just stayed in Africa, and the number of slaves in Africa increased, which means the Atlantic slave trade did not increase the number of slaves. That was a fixed quantity. So Martin loved to wax poetic about the immorality of slavery. Well, if whites hadn't bought slaves from those blacks within Africa, they would all still be in Africa today and would be much poorer in every measurable way. So the act of buying slaves and shipping them to the Americas was at worst a morally neutral act, but really it was the best thing that could have happened to these people because they were going to be slaves either way. It was just a question of where. And the Americas, with the exception of a few Caribbean islands that were actually death camps, the Americas were much better bet than the Middle East or remaining within Africa. So regarding reparations for slavery, what would that even mean? Would that mean that the blacks have to pay whites the differential between their standard of living in the US versus what their life would have been as a slave in Africa? No, the correct response for whites on the question of black slavery is you're welcome. But let's forget about slavery. Martin also liked to go on and on about the oppression blacks were facing at the time. While they weren't facing any systematic discrimination by the courts, not even in the Jim Crow South, compared to the way blacks are treated by the courts today. For first time offenders, repeat offenders, black sentences were very similar to what they are today in terms of the racial ratios, even in the deep South where Jim Crow was supposedly the worst in Mississippi. Now, you can cite popular perception and black people throwing tantrums over having to follow the rules, and they did that back then and they do that now. But blacks throwing tantrums and cucky whites apologizing for them and writing speeches for them doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean they're actually oppressed. Their complaining, their rage, is not evidence that they're actually put upon. Because you can get mad and you can throw protests at will, whether something is unfair is being done to you or not. So the fact that they're having protests and that they feel put upon doesn't mean they're actually put upon. And in terms of going to prison as a multiple of whites, the ratio is much higher today than it was during segregation. This is also true for lynchings. The overrepresentation of blacks in lynchings was actually less than the current overrepresentation of blacks incarcerated for violent crimes today. Because remember, all these lynchings, they were all based on accused crime. The most common cause for lynching was cattle theft. Not whistling at a white woman. No, it was cattle theft was the most common cause for lynching. And the total number of people lynched or hanged publicly by a mob, that's all it is, was around 5,000 people. I'm not supporting this mob justice, just like I don't support slavery. I'm just 
pointing out that they were actually less racially biased than the current legal system is. What about poverty? Well, blacks were obviously much wealthier than Africans, and they were much wealthier than most people on the planet at the time. And one thing to note is that as far back as 1880, when you controlled for the region they were in, when you controlled for the type of labor that they were doing, blacks earned 89% of what whites earned. But also, there's no reason to assume that in a meritocracy, blacks and whites would earn the same amount. They're just there's just no reason to think that. Unless you have some profound evidence to the contrary, blacks earning 50% of what whites earn could be totally fair, could be a totally fair reflection of what they're doing. One thing that teachers love to bring up is that blacks had lower school funding, and this is a real big deal for them because teachers love to tell you about how they're underfunded. Black schools, on average, had about half as much funding per pupil as white schools. And back in the day, you could have said this and imagined that once you equalize the funding for schools, that the race gaps would go away. But we've tried that. The funding has been equalized, in fact, more than equalized, and the race gaps are as wide as they ever were. Shockingly, teachers will tell you how they always need more money and that they're always underfunded and that a school being massively underfunded is going to result in lower scores, right? And, and they'll literally always say this. So this may seem like a plausible sounding idea, but the truth is schools today and probably back then could do with less than they're getting. And the underfunding of the black schools, yes, it happened, but the presumption that it mattered is, I think, just a kind of a myth that teachers who work in schools like to say. But then there's the whole premise of this is absurd. Did whites ever even owe blacks equal funding? After all, whites were paying virtually all the taxes and whites in the South didn't even consider blacks to be real citizens since they acquired their citizenship through a constitutional convention where the Southern states were represented by union occupied state governments. They didn't have, a, they didn't have any voice in the passing of the constitutional amendment that granted black citizenships. The white Southerners themselves never actually agreed to black Blacks becoming citizens. And that's the absurdity of Martin's moralizing. He's demanding the sun and the moon from Southern whites who never agreed to be countrymen with Blacks in the first place, but had it imposed upon them by what they considered to be an invading foreign power. A bunch of whites further north who, to rub salt in the wound a little bit, they didn't even have to actually live with these Blacks. The whites in the South were the ones who are going to have to pay the price of Black citizenship. And on top of all this, whites didn't even benefit from slavery, not even at the time. Now today, we know that the net fiscal effect of blacks, what they get from government minus their taxes paid, is around minus $300 billion per year. So whites are paying a very heavy price for slavery today. That's about half the defense budget. But even at the time, Southern investment was directed towards the dead end of slavery, right? a kind of feudalism, while in the North, all the investment was being diverted into industry. At most, you could say that blacks made a few plantation owners very wealthy by working on cash crops. But whatever wealth that the black slavery generated for a few really rich whites in the South, that was more than wiped out by the cost of the Civil War. And that's really the most important takeaway. Blacks benefited massively from being slaves in the U.S. as opposed to being slaves anywhere else, while whites have been paying heavy price for it. Even at the time, whites did not benefit from slavery. From having the southeastern United States be a pre-industrial backwater to the cost of the Civil War, to having to deal with third world Gibbs voting of blacks in the U.S., to the direct financial cost of blacks in the U.S., the blacks have been nothing but a ball and chain around the neck of white America. So what was the noble goal that Martin wanted? Well, on top of U.S. blacks being some of the wealthiest people on the planet, then and now, he was mad because they weren't as rich as the whites in the U.S. It's just envy. It's just greed. The black poverty Martin described in his speeches would be the life of kings outside of the U.S. or Europe at the time. And given that blacks in the U.S. at the time of Martin Luther King earned about 65% of what whites earned, that means they almost certainly had a higher standard of living than the average citizen of the Soviet Union, for example, the U.S.'s supposed mortal enemy, and a way higher standard of living than any Chinese or black African. But not just that. Not, Martin didn't want just the money and the gibbs and the stuff. No, Martin wanted to deny white spaces. Because whites like having their own pools. They like having their own churches. They like having their own schools free from the chaos that you get from black neighborhoods and black schools. Martin wasn't satisfied with just 
funding equality, with just getting the money from whites, with just taking their stuff. No, he wanted whites to let him into their clubs. I mean, what kind of a psycho thinks that way? This is not noble. This is not nice. This is not good. This is pushy and domineering and kind of sick. If someone doesn't like you, just stay out. What is your problem? What's wrong with you? Here's something most people don't realize. The 1964 Civil Rights Act didn't matter much because that just removed laws requiring discrimination. The big opposition to the c civil rights movement, the forced association movement, came with the second act, which forced whites to allow blacks into their diners, into their churches, into their schools, into their pools, into their bowling lanes. What kind of a psycho thinks this way? What kind of psycho demands access to spaces set up by other people? Why can't us whites just have a place for us. Just have a space for us. You have the whole rest of the planet for you. This theater is for the whites. One thing people like to say is that it's prejudice. Well, look, if it was prejudice, pre-Judice, pre-judging, well, then whites in the North would have a much more negative view of blacks than whites in the South do. But it's exactly the opposite. The more lily white someplace is, the more positive their views on blacks are. Prior to general emancipation, the city of Philadelphia did not have any kind of legal segregation between the races. And there was no neighborhood in Philadelphia that was majority black. And this is because the blacks who went to Philadelphia prior to general emancipation were those who earned their freedom prior to general emancipation. They were the higher quality blacks that managed to get out of slavery before Lincoln gave it to everyone. Now, there are no polls on white opinions at the time. However, there's no evidence that the blacks of Philadelphia were especially criminal or especially shiftless, and there was no movement by the whites in Philadelphia to quarantine them, to segregate them, to ghettoize them. It wasn't until after the Civil War that you had the mass influx of former slave blacks from the South that Philadelphia started to introduce segregation laws against blacks, confining blacks to certain parts of the city, and of course those black areas very quickly turned into, well, Africa or Haiti. You know, wherever blacks take over an area, it turns into that. This was in response to the influx of the rest of the black population and learning about their ways, the ways of those that did not earn their freedom, but instead had it handed to them by Lincoln. And it was in response to the behavior, to the content of the character of these blacks that the whites in Philadelphia started to take action. It wasn't pre judice it was post Judice. It was a reaction to what they actually were. It was a response to the content of their character. For those like Martin who like to push the myth of prejudice, it's the exact opposite. Those with the most experience with the Negro, whites in the South, whites on the continent of Africa, are precisely those that form the most negative opinions of the Negro and support laws restraining him. Segregation, apartheid, if anti-Negro sentiment was a result of pre-Judice, as Martin seems to assume, then by all rights, whites in the North should be the most negative towards the Negro, and whites in the South should have the most positive views of the Negro, since they have the most experience with them. So what really can we say about St. Martin's Day? The man himself was a fraud. He was a front man for a larger movement, pretending to be some downtrodden preacher speaking truth to power when actually he was the agent of the powerful. His cause, Gibbs from Whitey, and access to their clubs. This kind of childish, psychotic thinking was somehow transmuted into something noble and somehow conning whites into thinking that blacks were oppressed. They never were oppressed. Whites didn't enslave blacks. They bought them from other blacks in Africa and frankly gave them a better life in the Americas. A better life than most people in the world at the time had, than most of the serfs and peasants in Russia, China, and India had at the time. The alternative to this was that they would have remained not free, but slaves within Africa. By demanding things from whites, blacks are punishing whites for giving them this better life. Then whites freed the black slaves, in fact, ended slavery worldwide, but that's another topic for another time. And whites carved out segregate spaces for them, giving them their own neighborhoods, their own housing, their own schools. Not as good as what the whites had, but certainly better than what the typical Russian would have. But the blacks weren't happy with this. It wasn't enough. Sure, they were richer, they were living longer and healthier lives than most people in the world, but they were poorer than their immediate neighbors, the white Americans. They weren't keeping up with the Joneses, and they only earned anywhere from 60 to 70% 
to vote whites earned depending on the year you look at. Now, despite the blacks not having even earned this, despite blacks not even having earned this, but being sort of handed this by the whites, the blacks wanted not only what the whites had, but demanded that whites not be able to keep them out of their spaces. Now, when groups are actually oppressed, like the Armenians or the Greeks under the Ottoman Empire, they want independence. They fight for independence. The blacks never wanted independence because they were never actually oppressed. They wanted just the opposite. They wanted an end to segregation within the United States, the exact opposite of independence. They wanted more stuff from whites. They wanted more contact with whites. They wanted the end of the barrier between black and white spaces, that somehow they got it in their head that they had a right to access to whites. Do Arabs have this problem? No, even though the Arabs actually took in more black slaves than the whites did, the Arabs are off the hook because what the Arabs did is they castrated all the males and worked them to death. So nobody's demanding anything from the Arabs because they're all dead, right? No, if whites just outright exterminated all the blacks after the Civil War, would a non-existent black population be demanding all sorts of stuff from whites? No, they wouldn't. But because whites did not exterminate the black slaves like the Arabs did, now we must be punished. Now we must pay the price. We must pay a price that the Arabs don't have to pay because the Arabs exterminated all the blacks. If what I'm saying here seems hard to believe, look, how are, how are the blacks today behaving? Whatever, whatever you think of me, whatever, whatever moral overlay you have on me, how are the blacks today behaving? They're behaving in a way that would only be defensible in the context of some sort of history of oppression. If you just looked at how they behave today and just took that in isolation, you would say that sort of as a group, they're shitty people. That's what you would say. It is only in the context of some sort of past oppression that you will see them as anything but just kind of shitty people. Now, what I'm saying is that the past is like today, that they were never oppressed back then, that, that being made to live in your own space away from whites, that's not oppression. You have your space, we have ours. Yes, your space is not gonna be as good, but it's better than most spaces on the planet and you have a right to improve it. The idea that they were never oppressed, that the way they behave now is the way they behaved back then, that should be your starting assumption. Anyone who wants to say that the past was radically deviant from how it is today in terms of how they behave, the burden has to be on them. If anything, my view shouldn't be called the alternative hypothesis, but really the default hypothesis.